Hello, AP Psychology. So we're continuing with experiments. So at this point, you have come up with your hypothesis. First your theory, your hypothesis, then your uh, directions. Now you've conducted, you pick what type of experiment. You conduct the experiment. Now you have all these numbers. What do you do with them? You come up with some sort of graph. And then you, now it's time to analyze that graph. Analyze the data that you will come up with. So there are multiple things that you can do. Um, it will be required that you know the following terms and be able to analyze and interpret experimental data. Yeah, FRQ stuff. So we do need to know this. Central tendencies are central or typical value for a probability distribution. Um, so basically, a central tendency is an average, okay? But you're not going to write that on your, you know, if you're writing an essay, you're going to write about central tendencies. But the idea is that there are averages, what's basically happening. So bringing you back to, to math, <laughs> um, here are some of the ways that you determine a central tendency. First, you can look at the mode, the most frequent occurring score. Then you can look at the mean, which is the average score. So coming up with an average for a mean, if there are five numbers, you add them all up and divide it by five. Median, the middle score of a distribution. So meaning you have to take the scores not in the, in the order in which you receive them, but in the order from the lowest to the highest, and then you find what the middle one is. Uh, range, so it's literally take the highest score and the lowest score, and then you add them together and divide it by two. Uh, then you're looking for the standard deviation. How much scores vary? Um, sorry. So how much scores vary around the mean? So the square root of the sum of deviations divided by the number of scores. I highly doubt they're going to ask you to come up with a standard deviation on the exam. I don't think you have access to a calculator. But if it's referenced, that's showing you how much the scores vary around the mean, which is the average score. So you have the average score. And then were there a lot of deviations from that? What were some of the other scores um, received? or numbers received. All right, now we're going to look at variables and validity. So your experiment has an independent and dependent variable. The experimenters manipulate one or more factors to observe the effect on some behavior or mental processes. So we manipulate a factor, which is the independent variable. And then we observe the effect, which is the dependent variable. So the key is being able to identify the independent variable from the dependent variable, as well as other variables. And they may not write independent variable, they may just write IV. Hold on. <laughs> All right, so here's an example. Experimenters, they want to know if studying flashcards will help test scores. The flashcard is the independent variable, and the test results are the dependent variables. So we're seeing if the independent variable, the flashcard, impacts the dependent variable, the test score. There are other variables to think about as well. Confounding variables, which I think have been brought up on a number of our questions that we've talked about this year. These are the undesired variables that can impact the data. Something that's not controlled, something you can't skew for. Um, in the flashcard experiment, it could be things like age, intelligence, gender, socioeconomic status. Um, there are things that we, the confounding variables in every single experiment. When you're creating your experiment, your job is to figure out how to minimize that the most that you possibly can. The experimenter can control some of them and attempt to minimize it, but there's always going to be something there. So if you're doing this flashcard experiment, you want to make sure that you're giving these flashcards to all ninth graders. Right? Because if you give these flashcards to a five year old, a 15 year old, and a 20 year old, and a 20 year old, it, no, 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 no. You, you know, you're going to get all different results. Um, you may also make a number of males to females equal. Um, because if there are 20 males doing this and five females, that's not really, ex there, that's a confounding variable. Gender is going to impact this. Um, in terms of socioeconomic, maybe you want to do this all in one school. 
right? Or in one district. So these are called control variables. This is anything that's going to remain constant or controlled by the experimenter. So in order to minimize your confounding variables, you come up with control variables. Confounding variables are things that are out of your control where you are putting things in place to try to control. Make sure that this experiment is accurate and that if someone else does it, they're going to get similar results. So experiments are always going to be judged. They're going to be valued and some of them may be dismissed. Statistical significance is like, essentially is likely probable is the likely probability that chance was not responsible for the results of the studies. So confounding variables were minimized, maybe even eliminated, and you are left with an essentially pure experiment. The results of that experiment would be statistically significant as opposed to an experiment plagued by multiple confounding variables. So just to use that, um, sorry, that flashcard example again, you don't want to do that experiment in an honors class because all the students there are intrinsically motivated, right? Their desire to learn already. You would want to go to a quote, like general class, right? You wouldn't want to go to AP. You want to, again, I'm going to do this experiment and it's going to be applicable to most people. And based on whether or not we think that this can happen again, it's as we're looking at significance, right? Is it a fluke? Is this a one-time deal? Um, or is it something that can be applicable to other group? Okay, when you're conducting the experiment, you want to figure out what groups of folks am I picking from? How am I picking them? What are they going to look like? So random selection and random assignment are required to ensure statistical significance. So a representative sample must be randomly selected, right? So if, I am so sorry. So if you watch that show 100 Humans, they have 100 people. And then the experiment they do will be for like 25. They'll randomly pick from the 100 with the machine, which is super important, okay? Then the randomly selected group should then also be randomly assigned to the experimental and the control group. You're not going to pick out, oh, you look like you'd benefit from the experiment. You don't. You go experiment and you go control. So that needs to also be randomly assigned. So I know this is a, these are two terms that sometimes students got confused with. So random selection is you picking who's going to be part of this um, experiment randomly and then randomly assign let's say you have 100 folks half of you are going to go into the control group and the other half are going to go into the experiment and that needs to be randomly random as well so the process of selection assignment through random systems best ensures for no biases or lack of diversity in your experiment so sorry jack literally just hit me with something so if you are testing political beliefs um you want to pull groups um by sex uh, uh, as males and females of various groups because people have biases. All right, you've done the experiment. Now you got to figure out if it's valid, right? So a valid experiment, you need a large sample size. A small sample size can produce inconsistent or anal anal anomalous results, right? So if one student is given the flashcard and bails um, and one receives an A with no cards, such valid research, right? No, you need to have, um, because there are too many confounding variables because the sample size is way too small. So poor, strong performance on a test could be because of sleep, intelligence, etc. So basically what we're learning from this slide here is in order for your um, experiment to be valid, you need to have a substantial sample size. All right, we're done with research and experiments. He's fine. He's going nuts in the back or he's destroying his room. Okay, I hope that was helpful. If it isn't, um, and you need more resources, let me know, okay?